In this video, we've got an old Chev Suburban with wipers that won't move under low power. We'll explore how to prove the diagnosis before spending money on parts. And we'll take apart an old module to see what went wrong. Good morning, guys. 2000 Suburban intermittent windshield washer problem. I got it to malfunction uh, yesterday in a heavy rain. And you can see we've got good high, high speed function. When I switch it to low speed or intermittent, it doesn't uh, even come down to rest. And I switch through the passages on low speed. I'm not getting anything right now. I was getting intermittent. It worked for a, a minute or so and then it quit. And it'd freeze at various positions. What's the problem? I think the motor is likely good just because I, I get very consistent motor function. So we're down to either the multifunction switch here in my left hand or the module. Statistically the module would be more likely, but let's make the diagnosis correctly and then replace the correct part without having to guess. So the module is going to be underneath this cowl and so I'm just going to get these clips off. There's one there all the way along and there are a couple of push pins I'll have to pull out as well. Dang, I can see the motor and the connector for the module right in there, but I just don't really have enough access to adequately back probe it. And so I'm going to take off at least this uh, wiper blade and uh, that'll allow me to pull the cowl uh, partly out of the way. Of course, before taking off a wiper arm, you want to mark its position. Pop off this cap. Ha, great. This is 13 millimeter. I'm going to use a fancy tool specifically designed for this, but you could just pry up on it if you're careful. Just make sure you don't break anything. Here's a little tip to help you get this cowl off easier. These corner tabs come off. They're just put in with three push pins. And uh, you can see right there, um, two at the top going into those two slots there, and then one at the bottom. So that gives me a pretty good view of the connector right there behind this wire here. You see it? And uh, Pro might be happy with this exposure just to get the diagnosis, but it's, I can see it's really dirty in there, and I'd much rather have a clear view. So I'm going to take off the other wiper arm. So here's a close-up view of the wiper on attachment point. You notice it's splined on both sides, so you, you can't uh, obviously rotate it. You have to just pull it straight off, and it can be pretty tight. You can see it's all rusty there. We'll have to put some anti-seize on that. Um, the the uh, right side was a bit tight, but with that tool I managed to get it off easily. I pulled the washer tubing off this little nipple here. Fortunately, didn't break it, and that gives me more room. Okay, I've used a block of wood right here just to push the cowl up and out of the way. Now I've got this triangular metal plate with these four bolts. These are 10 millimeter. I'll take those off now. There we are. You'll want to mark the shaft somehow so you'll know it's back at home base before putting wiper arms back on. Now I'm taking the tape off the connection to the wiper control module shown on the right of this schematic drawing. A quick glance at the wiring diagram should allow you to predict the voltage you expect to find on the gray wire, which is where all the action happens. When it calls for high speed, the multifunction switch sends 12 volts directly to the module across both the purple wire and the gray wire, bypassing an upstream variable resistor that acts as a voltage divider on that gray wire. At low continuous speeds, you'll get 12 volts only on the gray wire. When you choose slower intermittent speeds, that incoming 12 volts is dropped across the variable resistor, reducing voltage on the gray wire. So when current is flowing, we should see different voltages on that gray wire as we rotate the speed control. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick and dirty method of measuring voltage on that gray wire as I rotate the speed control through various intermittent positions. If I see differing voltage along that wire, then I'll conclude that the multifunction switch is playing its role, in which case we'll look further to the uh, module to see if that's the problem. Now, there's a trap you can fall into if you test two modules together, and I'll explain that with a question. Suppose the multifunction switch was normal, but the uh, downstream module was so fried that you couldn't get any current flow on the gray wire. What would you see on that gray wire if you were to test that? Yeah, 12 volts. 
So if you see 12 volts consistently, despite turning the multifunction switch dial, don't assume the multifunction switch is bad. Any uh, voltage divider requires a voltage drop with current flowing to see those voltage drops. So you need to separate in the two modules in that case and test each individually. Okay, I back probed the purple wire and I get 10.9 volts here. It's a little bit spotty, but clearly that's under high. Let's back probe the gray one now. 11.0. So we're getting good voltage there uh, under high. Of course, it's working. Let's back probe the green one. 1.5 volts right there. I'll shut that off. You can't really see it, but uh, I've got 11 volts on the gray wire right now under high. So let's um, switch to low level function and see what happens. Still 11.19 volts, and it's off. And now we're under, under variable, 1.34 volts. Two notches down, so I've got it set really slow, 1.17 volts. Well, rather than bore you with the details, here's a quick summary of the data. You can see that as I rotate the intermittent speed control, voltage on that gray wire changes. So we can make two conclusions. The module is providing a pathway to ground for that gray wire. And more importantly, the multifunction switch is communicating and playing its part of the game. Let's move on to inspect the module. Let's take this module off. Three T25 Torx screws that are just pulled off. Here we are here. Look at all that lube everywhere. Oh, look. There's a capacitor that's broken. See that? Okay, let me have you look at this here. This is pretty amazing. I don't know if you can see it with, without binocular vision, but if you look right here, my first thought was that this is a capacitor, but I think it's actually a Schottky diode. Do you see it's actually broken? See the big crack right there? That's amazing. So it overheated and it broke this thing. I can't read the numbers on it. I might put it on the, on, under the other magnifier and try and get a sense for the numbers because you can replace these. But I think the real question is why did it um, happen and is that the only issue? And these are freely available and fairly inexpensive. I think they're about $50. I think I may just get another one. Okay, here's a new part from Rock Auto. It came with a GM instruction sheet, which is useless. Part number is right there. The uh, mounting screws are provided as well. Uh, these are T25. There are three of them. This is the old one, and these are the new ones. They're also T25, although they look, look a little different. Aside from that, I'm not seeing any difference. The components look almost identical. There are no markings on this diode either. Uh, I may just take this other one apart, but in any case, let's just uh, put it on now. In the instruction seat, they, they say to use Loctite 598 for the uh, flange. I don't have any of that on hand. I do have some 518 and ultra blue. I think I'll use this ultra blue. Just cleaning some of the debris off. It looks to me like this is on a continuous ring uh, worm gear. Connector looks okay. And uh, with a continuous worm gear and the um, arms being dedicated to exactly the position of the wiper arm, I think if I just put it on blindly and then just try it out, I think I'll be okay in terms of position. Don't need a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> it took a moment to seat this down properly. I didn't want to cross thread it. Then a little dielectric grease for the connector. This is CRC. All right, moment of truth. Let's see how it works. This is low. So that wasn't working before and it's working now. Let's try intermittent. And intermittent is working too. 
Now that we know the new one works, let's take the old one apart and see what we can do with it. I'm going to take out this diode. I can see a little better than you can with binocular vision, but in any case, LT9937 220-59733. Let's look that up. So I did a Google search for the data sheet on that rectifier diode and I didn't come up with anything. Truthfully, I'm not even sure if it was either a rectifier diode or a Schottky diode, it's hard to say. I'm told that they take about six amps, so they take quite a bit of current and it's clearly a weak point in the system. I'd be interested if anybody has any experience with replacing just the diode. It'd be easy enough to do if you could find the right part. From my perspective, it's raining today and I've got the car back to functional status, so I'm happy with how things have evolved. Thanks for dropping by.